If you would open up uh, your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 5. That's where we find ourselves this morning. And just a couple things. I had a, we had a good time on vacation. My wife and I, we spent time with our family and uh, extended family. And so uh, that's, Chris is uh, also vacationing this week. So you can be praying for him that he have a good time of R&R. Um, just a couple things that I just want to share that I'm really, uh, really thankful for. Um, one has to do with uh, just the VBS outreach. I'm so really just thankful for that. So are the elders that uh, many of you served in that capacity. And uh, there's just a lot of fruit from that. The gospel went out and kids heard the gospel. So keep praying for that. Um, just another thing was encouraged by this week, and that is Tuesday. The ladies had an outreach and uh, Debbie Knobloch got to share the gospel. And um, just very encouraged. You know, we plan those things. But if you don't invite anybody, those things don't go over real well, you know. And, uh, but when you invite and you come, and uh, it was just a, I wasn't there, but uh, it was a ladies' event. But uh, just have been hearing great things from that event. So just want to encourage you to uh, keep obeying the Lord when we have those outreaches. And uh, it's just uh, very encouraging to those who plan it and to, as the gospel goes forth. And a lot of uh, women were able to hear the gospel, so be praying for that. So. Um, it's good. The, the only thing, the only thing that uh, I would like a change in is on vacation, I listened to the VBS kids thing over and over and over and over and over. So Jenny, if you're here this morning, I'm looking for 2023, the, the next CD video or the, the CD music video. So anyway, I, I like number three, the Wombat uh, song. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, what's the name of the song? Uh, um, amazing uh, Creation or something like that. But anyway, all that to say, um, we had a good time on vacation, and I'm looking forward to 2023, the next, the next CD. Okay, John, John chapter uh, 5 in your Bibles. Um, you know, just, just in, in introduction, you know, the, the world is not opposed to religion, Think about that. Even in America, we praise that there's many religions, but the world is opposed to God, right? I mean, that's why the church is, I believe, being affected by this uh, ecumenical movement. I mean, you have these wonderful, so-called wonderful sayings like, well, all faiths, Tim, basically believe the same thing, or all that matters is what you want to believe, or how about this one? Doctrine divides. Different beliefs unite. That's not true. That's not true. The more different things the church believes, there's more there's going to be disunity in the church. That's true. The largest denomination that I would say used to be conservative just met this past June and when you have a person stand up and say that God will smile on us when we ordain women, that's a big deal. Do you think that that convention is now coming together and they're real unified? People are leaving that denomination. It's not more and more united. It's more and more divided. I mean, how does God feel about this? If you just let me just read you First Timothy chapter First uh, Timothy chapter six says uh, Paul says this: If anyone advocates a different doctrine, different doctrine, i.e., would be if a woman can be a pastor now, and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, and evil suspicions, and constant friction. Not unity. <laughs> There's constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And so that's how God feels about that subject. When we say that you know doctrine divides, different beliefs unite, that's not true. Doctrine, when you have a central core of doctrine, it actually can unite. 
It can actually unite, and that's what it does. And the Bible teaches us that the wrath of God is revealed against all those who have rejected him and suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. So people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness are rejecting God and what he says. And think about this. When Jesus comes to his own, he comes to his own. He comes to the, his own kinsmen, the, the Jewish religious establishment it says in John 1.11, he came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. I mean, think about this. When he comes to celebrate his first Passover after his ministry has been started, it's been inaugurated, he comes to his very first Passover. How did that go over? In chapter 2, verse 16, this is what, it, this is what happens. He made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and he poured out the coins of money changers and overturned the tables. That's how his first Passover went. How about when he goes to the first guy, the man, the teacher of Israel, Nicodemus? How did that conversation go? You, Nicodemus, a teacher of Israel? You should know that a person must be born again in order, in order to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus told Nicodemus, you don't accept our testimony in chapter 311. Every time Jesus goes to the religious Jews, they are hostile. I think I said a couple weeks ago, every time Jesus goes down to Jerusalem, something bad happens, right? And things heat up to the point where the Jews now, they're persecuting him. And we know eventually they're going to crucify him on the cross. Now in our text, we see that, that Christ, he could have gone anywhere, but the place he chooses to go is to the down and outers. Not the place of the religious intelligentsia, but he goes to the place where the lowly people are hurting. He goes to the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. And Jesus intentionally, I want you to just drive this home, understand this. Jesus intentionally chooses the man and the day for this to happen. If we look in John 5 with me, John 5, it says in verse 2, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porticos. So we looked at this a couple weeks ago. And my point is this, it's the Sabbath. Jesus knows it's the Sabbath. This wasn't like a slip of Jesus' mind. This is intentional. He knew this man. He knew the day where this man would be. In fact, Jesus will heal people at least seven times on the Sabbath day. There's, there's at least seven accounts in the New Testament where he specifically heals. We'll see that in John 7. We'll see that in John 9. He picked the day. Well, here he picks the man as well. He heals a blind man in John 9, uh, 13 and 14. And Jesus specifically chose to do this miracle on the Sabbath day. And he knows this is going to rub the religious establishment the wrong way. And by the way, we looked at that. Uh, could Jesus have waited 24 hours? Like even if the man had died at the pool. <laughs> we know he raised Lazarus from the dead. Well, even if the guy died at the pool, he could have still went on Sunday Jesus knows the days of the week, right? Oh, by the way, he's the one that created them. And thirdly, Jesus provoked this conflict because it was essential to the religious leaders to recognize his authority as God. That's the whole point. And so Jesus deliberately healed on the Sabbath to confront the spiritual bankrupt Jewish religion with its errors and with its hypocrisy. Because the religious leaders, they substituted their own traditions for the commandments of God. Remember, he says that you forsake the commandments of God for your traditions. And here, here we have God incarnate, the one who made the days of the week, Saturday, incarnate is standing right in front of them in their presence. And this is what he's doing. He's forcing them to choose. Are you going to choose me? Or are you going to choose your little Sabbath tradition? Which one are you going to choose? That's what's going on here. And so Jesus, he hadn't stumbled into this opposition. He, he hadn't like gone to the pool of and said, 
oh, I forgot it was the Sabbath. <laughs> he orchestrated it. He planned this. He didn't just go oops with this. And he wasn't going to go away quietly either to avoid this conflict, nor would he pretend to become someone other than he was. He's man's savior. He's the almighty God in a human body, and he's right there, right in front of him. Now, remember last time, we kind of ended in John 5, 16. But I want to look at, I want to look at a little, go into a little bit further, the reason for the Sabbath, why God instituted it, so you could see its purpose. I want to, I want to look at that this morning, because sometimes there's a, ah, there's a huge debate. Are we still under the Sabbath? Do we still practice the Sabbath? There's a lot of Christians that don't know what the Sabbath is for. And so we're going to look at that a little bit. And then when we hit John 7, I'm going to give a sermon between uh, the difference between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. There's a difference between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day, right? I mean, Sabbath is on Saturday. Lord's Day is on Sunday. We're no longer under the Sabbath. A lot of Christians get those confused. And we'll look at that in John 7. We're in John 5 now, right? Okay, so... Let's look at number one, the reason for the Sabbath. Why don't I just uh, read, uh, I'll start with uh, verse 5, okay? I'll start with verse 5, and I'll just read through down verse 17, okay? So read 5 through 17 with me. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he was already been, long, been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who he was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Well, point number one I want you to see is, what's the reason for the Sabbath? What's the reason for the Sabbath? Verse, if you look at back with verse 15, it says, um, verse 16 actually, it says, for this reason. You see that, for this reason? For this reason. Well, this man was, for 38 years, who, is, who had been, uh, couldn't walk, paralyzed or whatever, he went away and he had told the Jews that Jesus made him well on the Sabbath, as it says. On the Sabbath, I think, is mentioned five times in this passage. It's a key word. And so that's the reason why the Jews are mad, right? And so the verbs here throughout this verse, they're imperfect. They're indicating in verse 16 that this was Jesus' ongoing occurrence, meaning he kept healing people on the Sabbath. That's what he kept doing. And so he kept violating what? He keeps violating our man-made traditions. Right? So that's the deal. So the Jewish leaders, they're determined to reject the Lord and hate him for his kindness and persecute him for doing good. That's what they're doing. Now, according to Jewish rabbis, there was considered it was a violation of the fourth commandment. So you can't do that. You can't take up your pallet and walk. You can't do that on the Sabbath. Well, under the Old Testament law, there were some Sabbath day restrictions for Israel. I'm just going to list them for you real quickly, so you have to listen. You can write these down if you want. They couldn't kick, cook anything, Exodus 16.23. They weren't not to gather manna, Exodus 16.26. They couldn't go anyplace, Exodus 16.29. They were not to do any type of work. We'll talk about what type of work that is, Exodus 35.2. They were not to light a fire, Exodus 35.3. They were not to gather sticks, Numbers 15, verses 32 through 35. They were not to carry a load. They were not to carry a load or bring anything into Jerusalem. That's Jeremiah 17, 21. We're going to look at that a little bit further. Number eight, they were not to load anything on donkeys, Numbers 13, 15. But the point of these Sabbath rules was to be a day in which they were to focus on God. 
and not just the normal business, commerce, making some money, making a buck, okay? Well, just like every other day. So th this becomes a trigger point that, this, that set the Jewish leaders on a course of hostility and opposition against Jesus. And Jesus knows, later he will ask them, he's going to ask them this in John 7, verse 23, are you guys angry with me because I healed a man on the Sabbath? <laughs> he asks them that because he knows that. And so Jesus just cuts right, right to the chase. He addresses the issue that the real cause of the Jewish leaders' hostility towards him and hatred was, for, was, I healed a man, and I'm claiming to be God, and you guys are mad. And so he will defend himself by declaring that he is equal with God in verse 17. We'll look at this a little later. And it's just a clear implication. Jesus says this so many different ways. I'm God. And he's also, he's Lord of the Sabbath. And God, the Father, and God, the Son, they, can, they have the right to lift the Sabbath law at will and to make exceptions and do anything they want with it. And in John 7, Jesus pointed this out. He said, uh, come over to John 7, verses 22 and 23. John 7, verses 22 and 23. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? See, God, who's Lord of the Sabbath, declares that the Sabbath should be subservient to good works like mercy. Like Stan read, hey, when your sheep falls in a pit, what do you do? Oh, let it die. Who cares? No, you take it out. You care about the animal on the Sabbath. Right? And so that's why he says in Matthew 12, what man is there among you who has a sheep and it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? The implication is Jesus condoned such an act of mercy and performed on the Sabbath as being, that's lawful to do. That's acceptable to do. Surely healing a man on the Sabbath who's been lame for 38 years isn't bad, is it? That's why he says in Matthew 12, verse 12, how much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So when the Jewish leaders discover that the man doing these, those things, they're just shocked by this. You know what the issue really is? Here's the, here, here's the punchline. Who calls the shots on the Sabbath? They're saying we do. And now they're saying he's calling the shots. We don't like that. That's the issue. That's the issue. The issue is who's Lord on the Sabbath? Pharisees think they are. Jesus is saying, no, I am. He had healed a man on the Sabbath, and the Jews had rejected him for doing so. The word Sabbath is the word uh, Hebrew. It uh, means rest. The Lord commanded Moses to observe the seventh day of the week as a day of rest. The Sabbath was to set aside a day for God's people to cease from daily labor and to contemplate him and to, to glorify him. And the Jews had taken the Sabbath and they changed it into something that it never meant to be. I'll never forget living in Encino, Jewish community, had rabbis all over me when I was going to seminary. And the rabbi would speed at 5 o'clock, go 50 mile an hour down a 30 mile an hour road. And then he would say some things that I can't say from the pulpit. And uh, then he would just run up and not say hello to anybody. And he'd go into his apartment, hey, is the stove off? Hey, is this off? You know what to the Jews it was? When I saw them on the Sabbath, you, you, you know what it looked like? It looked like the worst day of the week. It looked like they were miserable. It looked like, where's God? I'll never forget a man telling me how to wash his hands. He was a Jewish man. I go, God doesn't care about your hands. He cares about your heart. It looked like the most miserable Washing of hands I've ever heard of. <laughs> I, I just use Don soap. Blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? So it, it hasn't changed. It hasn't changed. Not one iota. It was the worst day of the week for them. This was to be a day dedicated to God. Who are you supposed to see? Who are the Gentiles supposed to see? 
Look at their God. He delivered them from Egypt. They don't have to gather manna on Sunday because he provides for them. Look at their God. He's going to provide a future Savior. He's coming back. Look how trusting of the Lord they are. Instead, you know what it was? Duty and drudgery all the way through. I think this is a good application, by the way. What's your God look like? Seriously, what's your God look like? Not only today, but also every day enjoy the Sabbath. We'll look at that in Hebrews 4. What's your God look like to unbelievers when you go to work tomorrow? What's he look like when you're in line at Dillon's, Walmart? What's he look like? The unbelieving world. They had figured out 39 categories of work and carrying things was one of them. They taught that you should not look in the mirror. They, they added to the, this is the Mishnah, they added to the word of God. They taught that you should not look in the, the mirror on the Sabbath because you might be tempted to pluck a gray hair out and that would be reaping. They said you could eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath, but you had to kill the chicken for Sabbath breaking because the chicken was working on the Sabbath. If you had a cask of wine in your house that began to leak, you could not plug up the leak on the Sabbath, but drinking it as it poured out was okay. Probably not a good thing. And so the Jewish leaders, they see this guy carrying this pallet, and he was not utilizing the proper legal loopholes. Therefore, this placed him in violation of the Sabbath, their little man-made rules. And notice, they're not even interested in this guy, compassion and mercy. This guy was healed. Nothing is mentioned about that. A miracle had just taken place, and they're upset because their rules were broken. And the Sabbath was to be a day in which all men ceased from their labors and gave themselves as remembrance to the Lord. It was a day of celebration, thanksgiving. It was a day to be enjoyed. It was a day of rest. And the work that God was talking about was ones living by the sweat of their brow. That's what he's talking about by marketing, by engaging in trade and not merely just carrying a rolled mat from under, under one's arm. It's not that. So this brings us into question. What did it really mean to keep the Sabbath? It meant that you did not labor on the day for your personal gain. That's the principle of the Sabbath. He, as God, had created the Sabbath as a blessing for man. This was to be a blessing, not a burden. And it was a burden to them. So it was his right, God's right, Jesus' right prerogative to use the Sabbath in any way he choose for the purpose of blessing man. So the Sabbath was to be a day of set apart for glorifying, for worshiping God, and for resting in Him. And think about this. What could better accomplish that than a man being healed on the Sabbath who had been lame for 38 years? Should that cause some rejoicing? Should that cause some worshiping? <laughs> yes, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, it caused the exact opposite. So this day, what's the Sabbath for? Can I just sum it up? It's dedicated to God. That's the Sabbath. In fact, in the Ten Commandments is found in Exodus 20, the occasion for the Sabbath is a reminder of the creation ordinance. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rest on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Exodus 20.11. I used this one when I lived in Encino. As they would tell me how they washed their hands or they would tell me, hey, we got to have the oven off or we can't cook or can't do this, can't do this. It was like, don't. It was like all prohibitions. Don't, 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 don't. I always use this verse on them. De Deuteronomy 5.15. The Sabbath was for Israel that they would remember that the Lord delivered them out of Egypt. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 5.15. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So I would say to them, when you tell me how to wash your hands, 
I don't see God. I don't see how you're remembering how God delivered Israel out of Egypt. Tell me about that. Tell me how great he is and how awesome he is. Tell me about the death angel. Tell me about how he passed over all the firstborn of Israel, but he didn't to the to, to Pharaoh's people, to the Egyptians, and all the firstborn died, and God preserved Israel. Tell me about that. Oh, no. No, we don't want to talk about that. No. no. Let's talk about washing hands. What? Doesn't make sense. So that's the reason for the Sabbath. It was a day dedicated to God. Part two is a heart problem. It wasn't a Sabbath problem. It was a heart problem, not a Sabbath problem. So Really, what they do with this guy, it's like a, they turn it into a criminal investigation. That's basically what it is. That's basically what it is. And their question was not an, uh, a pursuit of spiritual truth, but rather it's a criminal investigation. That's what it is. How absurd. But this is what we should have expected from them. We already see that in them. They have no interest in humbling themselves before the Lord. And they had a religious system that very much served them, and they wanted to keep it just as it was. And you know what? Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I want you to see this. Hear this. Sometimes when you talk to religious people, I was talking to a religious person a couple days ago, and they told me, my number one goal in life is to make sure no one goes hungry in Wichita. And that was it. It was their driving force. How about Jesus? How about, how about your sin? Where are you going to spend eternity? Everybody in Wichita could have a meal for the rest of their life and still spend eternity in hell. It's true. It's not a bad, it's a good humanitarian thing to feed people. It's no different. People haven't changed in their, you know, when you, when you talk about your relationship with God, I just want to ask you, what do you talk about? You talk about, oh, my church, I do this, I do this, I do this. Or do you talk about, he's done this. It's okay to talk about your church. But when, when, you know, when we're out sharing the gospel evangelism, and in fact, this Wednesday, do you know what people, the first question they want to go to is, they think something. So when we hand them a little, uh, little, a little uh, gospel track, they think that we want them to come to our church. It's the very first thing they think of. That's okay to invite them to church. But you know what I say? I say, you know what? We don't want you to come to our church. And they're like, what? Why? We care about their soul. This church won't save them. I share the gospel with them. They come here, go to another Bible teaching church. That's great, but that's secondary. But people are so, have the works built in them that they naturally are thinking, he wants me to come to his church so that I'll get saved. It's just natural. That's the way we think. That's the way we are. I think of Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, he justifies the ungodly. To the one who does not work. So, here we go. That was off the notes. So let's read John 5.10. John 5.10. Therefore the Jews were saying to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. Is this true? I mean, was it not permissible for a Jew to carry their pallet or in other words, their bed on the Sabbath? So obviously there's a difference of opinion between the Jews and Jesus here. So most likely the Pharisees concerning the answering this question if Jesus had felt that it wasn't permissible, he wouldn't have commanded the paralytic to take up his pallet and walk. But he did command him to take up his pallet and walk. And so clearly there's a difference between opinion between the Jews and Jesus. So how did this disagreement come about? Okay, how did this disagreement come about? Well, this command that led to this disagreement that God had pro pro prohibited work on the Sabbath. But I want to ask you a question. Did the work that God prohibit, including picking up a pallet or your bed and walking, did it include that? That's the question. Okay? So turn to Jeremiah 17. Turn to Jeremiah 17. 
I want to show you this as an example, as a, where, 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 where they might have been getting this from, but taking it out of context. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, verse 19 through 21. Let me read this passage for you. Jeremiah 17, verse 19. And the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the public gate through which the kings of Judah come in and go out, as well as all the gates of Jerusalem. And say to them, listen to the word of the Lord, kings of Judah and all Judah and all its inhabitants of Jerusalem who come in through these gates. Thus says the Lord, take heed for yourselves and do not carry any load on the Sabbath or bring anything in through the gates of Jerusalem. You shall not bring a load out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your Forefathers. So let me ask you a question. Does this passage, what does it prohibit? Does it prohibit carrying loads on the Sabbath? Answer, yes. It does prohibit loads from carrying on the Sabbath, but it is a specific type of load that is prohibited from being carried on the Sabbath. What is the very specific kind of load prohibited from being carried on the Sabbath? And this, it restricts Jews from carrying loads to the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath. In other words, the Jews could not carry loads for the purpose of commerce. They were doing it for money. So should the prohibition against carrying loads of commerce for commercial purposes have, a per have surprised any faithful Jew? Of course not. So in Jeremiah 17, 21 and 22, the work refers to the daily, you guys are still doing your commerce. You guys are still working. You're still in it to make money. Let me use a modern day example, if you don't understand this. Even though we don't keep the Sabbath, there are some similarities that we do on Lord's Day. Okay? We'll look at that when we get to John 7. But one of the similarities that we do, that they were to do on the Sabbath, and we do on Lord's Day, is worship God. Is worship God. Okay? So now, I want you to think about this. When my wife and I got married, I told her, I said, hey, you know I'm going to be a pastor, right? She goes, yeah. You want to be a pastor, wife? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay? So I said, one thing that, uh, this is a little rule, I said, one thing that you can't do, and that's this. When we go into ministry full time, it's going to be wise for you to not sell Pamper Chef products. Longer burger baskets, I listed them, candles, stamping products, having jewelry parties, because you'll be using the church. Because that's where a majority of our friends will be. I couldn't say, I didn't say she couldn't go to those parties. I said she couldn't be like the organizer and the one that's profiteering off of it. Because we'll be using the church making money. And we're not going to do that. Can you imagine Brandy in the foyer today? I tell you at the end of my sermon, hey, Brandy has a pampered chef little table in the back. And you know what? Fourth of July weekend, you get a candle too. <laughs> Think about this. What's Brandy going to be thinking during the whole time she's in worship? I wonder my sales. I wonder my sales. I wonder my sales. Would worship be going on in her own mind? Answer, no. That's what these Jews were doing in, in Jeremiah 17. They were carrying uh, uh, commerce in. They were making a profit. And so obviously a faithful Jew, one who is seeking not to work in order to keep the Sabbath day holy, one would have intuitively known this. It was obvious. If a Jew wanted to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, he would not be involved in that kind of activity. But for a man to pick up his pallet after the person, Jesus Christ, the Lord had healed him and commanded him to do so, is a far cry from choosing to engage in some type of commerce on the Sabbath. That's the point. I mean, why would the legalists do this? Why would these Jews in John 5 do this? Because they wanted to protect their man-made laws. Because they believed that personal righteousness had everything to do on the outside and not on the inside. That's why Jesus said, you guys are not concerned about the inside, the heart, you guys just kind of just, you take a buffer and you buff the outside of the cup. You shine it, you put the sparkling on it, and the outside of that cup looks beautiful. But inside, it's a stench. It's ugly. He said that. 
He said, you blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup of the dish so that the outside may become clean. It was a matter of the heart. It wasn't a matter of the Sabbath. The truth is the Sabbath was a mere shadow. It's a picture of an illustration of something that is real. And the Sabbath is a picture of the salvation that we have in Christ. And he has accomplished the work that was necessary by going to the cross and dying in our place. And when we come to faith in Christ, we cease from our labors and we rest in what he has done for us. That's why it's just amazing when you go out and share the gospel. The first thing people automatically think is they want me to come to their church so that I can be saved. It just flows from the heart. And Sunday, the Lord's Day, it's mentioned in Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 2, Luke 24, 1, John 21, Acts 27. What's interesting is it became the day, the Lord's Day for worship. And, was, and over time, Christians were actually kicked out of the Sabbath-keeping synagogues. And the earliest churches met on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday. That's why we meet on Sunday, by the way, not on Saturday. Turn to Hebrews. I think it'd be good to look at Hebrews at this time. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, if you would. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Here's the concept of Sabbath that's used to point to the accomplishment of what? Of Christ. The promise of rest is future, but the work of God that achieves it, it's in the past. The Jews in the Old Testament, they looked forward to the ultimate rest. We, the New Testament believers, look back because it's been accomplished. It points out that it's fundamentally different than the Old Testament rest. There the Sabbath rest was entered prophetically, but only one day a week. One day a week. And even that was not the true Sabbath rest. Some, like Joshua, indeed did enter the real and ultimate Sabbath rest, even in the Old Covenant. It was not a rest they entered by means of the law, though. Like Joshua was like, I keep the Sabbath on Saturday, therefore I've entered the Sabbath rest. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't a rest that they experienced once a week. Instead, it was a rest that they entered by means of faith in the future work of Christ. That's the ultimate rest. The people of God, you see that? The people of God in that verse enter a rest. We too can enter that same rest, only we too don't look forward as they did, but we look to Christ, the cross, back. So I think it's better to say that there is a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's every day in Christ. It's not a day, right? Colossians warns us of that. It's not connected to a day of the week, but rather a spirit in the heart that rests and trusts in Christ and his person and his work alone. I rest in that. That communion table we're about to do, it's just a reminder. I rest in the finished work and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we take communion. So doing deeds of mercy was a source of rest for Jesus. So isn't it entirely appropriate to heal a man on the Sabbath? It also caused recipients of such merciful deeds to glorify God. That was another activity that was highly encouraged on the Sabbath. Hey, glorify God. That's something you should do. But in contrast to this man are the Jews. They're, they are carrying no physical burden upon their shoulders, but the weight of their ordinances are a burden to them. Neither is it enough for them to carry such burdens. They also insist that you must carry them. You must do these things and keep to our laws. They see this man walking through the city, and so that's why they challenge him. You're not keeping our rules. Well, third point is this. 
Jesus claimed full deity equally with the Father. Look, look what he says. Come back to John 5. Come back to John 5. John 5, verse 17. This is, this is amazing what he says. John 5, verse 17. But he answered them, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. So how does this apply to Jesus' answer to the Jews' charge that by healing people, he was working, thus violating the Sabbath? Jesus' answer to them was that work, rest, and Sabbath mean what they say he means, not what they think it means. It's not what some council of rabbis has defined. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 8, he's Lord of the Sabbath. They aren't. That's what he's saying. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath because he is the Lord, God, and that is the ultimate truth that Jewish leaders need to accept, submit to, and embrace by faith. You guys remember the issue? Are you going to accept me as the Lord? Or are you going to hold on to your traditions? Which one? Which one is it? And so the crux of Jesus' proclamation was identity which exists between God the Father and God the Son. And this is what he's saying. When the Father works, the Son works. And when the Son works, the Father works. And the Father and the Son, they're always engaged in the same task. And as the Son is always going about the Father's business, Jesus was claiming a unique relationship with the Father, that He is God and has all deity, and He's the only begotten Son of God, and He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of the Father's nature, Hebrews 1.3. And Christ is claiming full deity. He was saying that He and the Father are one in essence and dignity, honor, and power and authority. And the, release, the reason the Jewish leadership was persecuting Christ for violating the Sabbath was that in their view, he had performed the work by healing this bedridden man. And Jesus, he's answering their accusation in essence. True, I was working. The Father's working. We're both working. We're one. So what? My Father's working too. We work together. I'm God. What are you guys going to do with it? That's what he's saying in verse 17. I'm Lord of the Sabbath. You know what that means? We must view our definitions of work, rest. It's got to be rooted in God's word and what he says and not what we say. And so just a reminder of uh, Hebrews 4.1 it says this, Let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. We enter God's own rest as we give up any notion of earning our salvation, believing in Christ, becoming born again, and according to his will, just rejoicing in eternal life that it's in Christ alone. And we have to stop resisting his will and surrender to his will. That also is implied in entering into his rest and relinquishing anything and everything that you're trusting in besides Christ and surrendering to him. Hebrews 4.3 says this, we who have believed enter that rest. Isn't that true? When you became a believer, you're like, I tried a lot of things. I tried my sin. I tried other religions. I tried this. I tried this. I tried relationships. I found all the, but it was all empty. It wasn't until I relinquished all those things and I just came to realize that I have to surrender myself and submit to the person work of Christ. And that's when I got saved and that's when I entered into his rest. Have you entered that rest? Hebrews 4.3, we who have believed enter that rest. That's what we're going to, about to be reminded of this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the Sabbath and what it, it meant and why you established it for the Jews. And basically, Lord, it was, it was a day dedicated to God 
It was not supposed to be drudgery. It was not supposed to be duty. It was supposed to be delight. And this is what, this is what and who our God is. And Lord, how much more now for us who celebrate on the Lord's Day, we look back to the cross and, Father, may we boast. May we boast, like Paul says, in the cross and what he's done. Because we are such great sinners in need of a Savior, Lord. And I just pray that we can think about that. I wonder what I look like to my unbelieving coworkers when I go to work. I wonder what I look like to the moms at the Christian co-op that I'm going to go to this fall. What do I look like to those moms? What do I look like if I'm claiming to be a believer, a Christian, and how I handle my money, how I handle my serving in the church? Lord, I pray that we would, whatever we do, we'd do the glory of God and it would manifest your name. It would put your name um, so highly above us that the people would see it, even as we... uh, live out our lives. And so, Father, I just pray as we enter now in the communion that uh, we're just so thankful that anything we do, anything we could ever do to try to earn our salvation is never enough, Lord. It's never enough. But we just enter what Jesus Christ has done, and we believe that, Lord. We believe what he's done. In your son's name I pray. Amen. I just want to say one thing before the men uh, distribute the, uh, the cup and the bread, and that is... Uh, if you are attending here this morning for the first time, second time, third time, and you haven't been with us when we've partaken of communion, we practice open communion. What that means is the number one requirement for communion is, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've entered that rest, please partake with us if you'd like, okay? And also, if there, we have children among us this morning, we uh, look to the parents at their discretion and discernment to talk to their children, maybe a good opportunity maybe to go home today and talk to them about what communion is. And so we leave uh, that up to the parents' responsibility. But as we participate in communion this morning, I just want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, The piano is going to be played, instruments will be played, and just some things to contemplate. Maybe ask yourself these questions or answer these questions as you're uh, contemplating. Number one is, have you entered that rest? Have you entered that rest that we just talked about? Meaning, have you denied whatever you're trusting in for your salvation and you're trusting in Christ alone and his payment that he paid for on the cross, the perfect righteousness that we could never achieve? Have you uh, submitted to his only way of salvation, his perfect righteousness? Remember, communion is uh, just a reminder of his perfect body, his perfect sacrifice, his blood, ransom life, this perfect life. When you think about rest, think about his provision. Think about his provision. And there's nothing outside of him that could ever provide for the forgiveness of your sins. And now do you lean on him for eternal life? Do you lean upon him for your sanctification? Not just for your justification, but for your sanctification. And are you resting in the person and work of Jesus Christ? Amen. Go ahead.
just want to read from you Hebrews chapter 10, verses uh, 11 and 12. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God for all time, once for all. If you want to separate a cup if you haven't already, the bread or crackers in the bottom of your, the juice. I want to read to you 1 Corinthians 11. Paul gave these instructions. We'll partake of the bread first. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the, the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Paul continues, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We do this in remembrance of our Lord. Partake together. Let me pray, and then you'll be dismissed, okay? Father, I thank you that we're not looking for a future sacrifice. We're not looking to the priest anymore. We're not looking to the blood of bulls and goats. No, there was... Christ came and he offered himself a perfect sacrifice for all time. Then he sat down at the right hand of the Father and so, Lord, we just thank you that that's what, we, that's what we enter into. That's what we believe, and we enter into that rest when we believe it. And, Lord, if someone has not entered into that, if they don't know about their salvation or where they're at, there'll be a couple up here afterwards. We'll be glad to answer any questions they have. Or, Lord, I'll be in the back the foyer. Um, I pray that they might come see me, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that uh, we would see that maybe nothing's changed as far as uh, that we, too, are to put... God on display this week. I pray that we might examine ourselves to see if we're putting God on display in our marriage and how we handle our children uh, when, we're, when we go shopping and when we go to work, Lord. I, I just pray that in whatever we do, we would glorify you and make your made known among your people, even among unbelievers as well. In your son's name I pray, amen. Have a good week.